When we're not good, Father, you're good to us, Lord. And God, we can trust you. We can put our confidence in you, our hope in you, Father God, because you are so good to us, oh God. And Father, we are not ashamed to worship you and we're not ashamed to tell you, Lord, that you alone are God, there is no other. Jehovah is Lord and you are the only God and we just worship and magnify and praise your name, Father. And God, I pray, Lord, just let that goodness, Lord, let that revelation of your goodness, Father God, give us peace and give us joy, Father. And we will give you all the praise and all the honor. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. You may be seated. I'm going to turn the mic down a little bit. I think I'm a little hot here. Praise God. Go ahead and let the children be released. And um, I just want to say, we, we were just blown away last night by what, what the church did for us for that, that uh, anniversary surprise. And my wife's just going to come up, and we just want to just tell you all thank you. But Lee's got the mic there, I think. The, uh, we, we weren't expecting that at all, and um, so uh, it was just unbelievable. So I just want to just personally just tell you all thank you all so much. And, um, and, and this church, it just really made me realize that, that truly this church is our family, um, we had a lot, my family was there, and we had some videos of, of our families, but just being a, amongst y'all like this made me realize this is our family, and um, so just from the bottom of our hearts, thank y'all for Travis and Christine opening up their, their home to host that, and I know Lee and Rachel and everybody that did all the planning and preparation for it and stuff, um, we were just like in shock, I mean that, we were just completely surprised, had no clue, my daughter Michelle drove in from Alexandria, and they said that they were coming in for a friend of Jade's um, somebody he knew for a baby shower and uh, they just drove all the way in and drove back just for the anniversary so it was um it was amazing and I so. just want to thank y'all also it's amazing when you look back at God they um our precious family um had pictures from our wedding and 30 years you realize how young you were how and I just I don't know I know y'all know my story my beautiful son Lee and his precious sister Michelle were in our wedding pictures I came to my husband in a mess, and he took me like a kinsman redeemer, and I just want y'all to know and feel so encouraged that God is so faithful. Yes. Whatever chapter, you ha you cannot judge a life by a chapter or a day right. or anything. Right. If you, in the bottom of your heart, surrender to the Lord over and over and over again, 30 years later, you'll have what we experienced, this most amazing. Yes. It was like... It was like Hebrews 11, the cloud of witnesses. Yes. Like we encourage each other in our marriage, but this was like everybody else saying, well done, well done. So whatever your work, you know, whatever, our walks are all different, our things, we, you know, our lives are different. But if you just surrender to the Lord and you get keep going and keep going and keep going, you'll be looking how young you were and your witnesses are going to say the same thing, well done. Yes. So we thank you all from yes. the bottom thank of our hearts. So You're amazing. Yes. We love thank you. you. And that's a lead. Delete. Hallelujah. Yeah, Lori told me that somebody told her when they were looking at the pictures that she didn't change. She, she looks the same, but no one said that to me. I mean, I mean so uh, I don't know what that means, but. Huh? That's bad. Right? <laughs> somebody did say my brother looked pretty pitiful, though, so I was glad to see that. That's why. But um, no, we were excited. It was unbelievable. I just want to say for those of you who are married here that you know, 30 years may seem like a long time, and it, and it is 30 years is 30 years, but I can tell you it doesn't seem like 30 years for Lori and I. I mean that. It really doesn't. And um, God is just so good to us. He's so faithful. And our, our family continues to grow. We have you know, our beautiful grandchildren, another, another grandson on the way. And so God has just been, we're just blessed beyond measure. You know, it was just such a blessing. So so thank you so much, and Lee's already mentioned this, but I just want to, first of all, just say thank you for Lee for preaching last week. He really only had about a week's notice for that. Um, my dad uh, took ill. He had been tested positive for COVID, and he had stayed home, and then the situation kind of got a little worse, and they had released him from the hospital. that He had been discharged about two weeks ago, and my mom, I told my mom, I said, don't go get him. I said, Lori and I will drive in, and we'll come um, with you into the hospital just to help help you get him home and get him settled and everything and they rolled him out to the car in a wheelchair and he couldn't even stand up and um, we just was standing there like we couldn't believe that he would be discharged in this condition I mean he, he didn't he couldn't lift his head up he just literally had no strength at all so we had to do a thing where we 
brought him back in from another place in the hospital and literally did like a second admit so we could readmit him. And good thing we did is the, the, they did a chest x-ray and pneumonia began to set in and they had to start giving him oxygen and stuff. And for a while there, it was really touch and go. We thought that they were going to have to intubate him and put him on a, a ventilator. And that probably wouldn't have been a good situation for him. So he was in the hospital for almost two weeks and uh, they gave him oxygen. And, um, you know, each day was, it seemed like a little bit of a, of a slight improvement. And then the doctor walked in um, last week, I think it was either Wednesday or Thursday, and he just was in shock. He said, I cannot believe the turnaround that you're making here. And um, so I just want to tell this church, thank you all so much for praying. That meant so much to us. And um, we, you know, the hardest thing about him being in the hospital was none of us could go see him. I mean, it's, you know, I know you've heard people talk about that in the news, and until you really experience, you don't really know how difficult that is. It's extremely difficult. And um, we talked on the phone every day, and we would talk sometimes twice a day. I'd call him, and he wanted to call. And, and um, so you got to know my dad. I mean, he's a, he's a different, you know, peculiar person, but he's, he, he's great. And, um, but he, he told me he loved me more than the last two weeks than he did in my whole life. And it was just really, you know, and Lee, Lee prayed the sinner's prayer with him and led him into, led him to Christ. So he, he had already done that before, but I think just as a, uh, you know, as a, as a reassurance of that and where he's at. So I believe that God, you know, uses all these things for a reason and for a purpose. And, um, and so, but he, he was just so kind, so sweet when he talked to us and everything. And so it was good. And today's his 82nd birthday. He's 82 years old today. So, so, um, so praise God. I guess God's got a few more days, a few more years for him to live. And, and you know, whatever he, you know, God gives him, of course, we'll cherish every one of them. And, um, but, um, so I just want to tell you as a church, thank you all so much for praying for him, that means so much. So, so praise God. So as we start this, this is the first, um, you know, Sunday of the new year, 2021. And, you know, I was going to sit here and kind of do like a review of 2020. But I got to thinking, I said, you know, God, God can do a much better review of 2020 than I can. So I'm going to let him do the speaking. And, um, and I believe the review of 2020 is found in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. It says, for everything there is a season a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to turn away, a time to search and a time to quit searching, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be quiet and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. And you know, really at the end of the day, I believe in 2020 or in any year that we have, the bottom line is we trust God. In other words, that that year that happened, that was God's sovereign design for that year. I mean, we have to, we have to trust him. And I believe the, the Solomon here in Ecclesiastes really kind of spells it out for us that there's a lot of things we didn't understand, we can't explain, we didn't like. But at the end of the day, God was still in charge. God was still sovereign. And um, the Bible says, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So, so every day in 2020, God made that day. You know, regardless of what happened or what came our way, that was the day that the Lord has made. So we can't erase it and say, well, it shouldn't have happened. It was bad. And Antoine said about the joy, and that's how we have to look at it. So, but I do want to wish everybody a happy new year. And, um, you know, as we think of 2020 and you look at the news and all the people who are celebrating the new year of 2021, I can't really ever remember a time when people were so glad to see another year, a previous year gone. I mean, I, I, usually it's like we just celebrate the new year, but we're not really upset that the previous year was, was gone. But this one is like everybody in the whole world is like, I cannot believe, we're just so excited that 2020 um, is gone. So, you know, and 2020, and a lot of people have said this, has been terrible. You know, we've had the lockdowns, the restaurant closures, the riots, no attending concerts, sports games, movie theaters, too many hurricanes to count, and a November election that is still not final. It still hasn't really been completely decided yet. So everybody would say goodbye 2020. So, um, but the way I see it, 
um, it really wasn't that bad. So before you rush into 2021, consider this. What if I told you in January of 2020 the following? You can work from home. Now, many of you who don't work from home probably envied those who did. I know when I, when I worked a, a, across the lake, when I was working at New Light, there would be like, I can't imagine what it would be like to work at home, not have to drive across the lake, get up early and do all those things. So if I told you in January of 2020 you get to work from home, you'd probably be kind of excited about that. And if I told you if you can't work from home, you can stay home and still get paid. $600 a week which for some of you was more than what you were making at your regular job. That's not a bad thing. That list of things you never do because you don't have time could all be done that last year in 2020. Like everything that you looked around at your house and in your yard and you said, man, I just, I don't have the time to do any of those things. If I told you in January of last year all those things could get done, wouldn't you be excited? I think you would have been. What if I told you you and your spouse are going to receive each a $1,200 bonus check? And depending on the size of your family, you receive as much as $3,400. Would you have been upset? I don't think so. So I know all joking aside, but really when you think about those things, and I know that that doesn't really erase the other things that happened to us, but everything wasn't all completely negative. And for some of us who received these additional bonus checks or whatever it was, we can still continue to receive our, our normal uh, weekly salary or we'll pay whatever. That, that didn't change. So for a lot of us, that was a, a, an, an added increase. And um, so, but really, if I could sum up 2020 in one word, it would be uncertainty. I think uncertainty would be the word for me to sum it up. And you know, uncertainty will inevitably lead to anxiety, which ultimately leads to fear. And, and that's really what we saw, I believe, last year is just, just a, just a culmination and a climax of fear, that people were just afraid of everything, of, of the uncertainty of the times and everything that we, were, that we were facing. So is anything certain? Can we really say, is anything certain? Well, in this world, no, there's not. But in the Lord, there is. There is certainty. And that's really what the church needs to look at. And um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 it says, for the message of the cross is foolishness, absurd and illogical to those who are perishing and spiritually dead because they reject it. But to us who are being saved by God's grace, it is the manifestation of the power of God. So our title of today's message, Keep Your Eyes on the Cross, Keep Your Eyes on the Cross. And, you know, as Christians, we approach 2021 just as we did in 2020 or any other year. Our confidence in who we are rests not in men, but in God. In other words, I don't approach any year worried about or concerned about what men are saying or what the world is, is going to do or not going to do. My confidence and my hope is in God, and my trust is in Christ. And as Christians and as believers, we need to place our hope in something that is unchanging, that is unmovable, that is unshakable. And, only, and the, only, the only place we can put our confidence in that is in Jesus Christ. See, what, uh, what we have received as Christians and in Christ still remains constant. 2020 hasn't changed who I am. It, it may have changed my perception of things in the world and, 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 and things like that, but, but who I am as a Christian, those things have not changed. I remain the same. I'm the same as I was in January of 2020 as I am standing before you today. I'm a Christian. I'm born again. I'm saved. I have a promise of a home in heaven. I have, a, I have a future of eternal life. I have all of those things. 2020 has not taken any of those things from me. And as Brother Antoine said, we still have joy. See, our joy is not based on circumstances. It's based on something that is certain, that is unchangeable. And as Christians and as, as believers, we need to trust in, in those things. So, so really, our lives as Christians must be centered on this statement Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And really, how profound is that statement in a world where there really is so much uncertainty? That we can't even utter the words that there really is something that we can say that is, that is the same, that has, that has never changed and that never will change or never can change. That's Jesus Christ. So that's what I believe God is calling us to do. So really, 
I believe that needs to be the Christian's battle cry as we embark on a new year, that in Christ I'm secure. That, that I believe in a lot of ways God hopefully was taking 2020 and for the church, yes, he was doing some sifting, but I think he was also doing, causing us to do some searching of what really matters, what's really important, what, 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 what is really valuable in my life, and causing us to really sit back and analyze those, those things in our life. And as a believer, we have to know it's Christ. It's our relationship with Jesus Christ and who the Lord is. So, so I believe in 2021, and it really, for every year as a Christian, God is calling us to look to him. Look to him. You know, God, God gave me a word, and this really wasn't the word today, but, 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 it was, but, but he, and he said, don't look to the left and don't look to the right. In other words, don't look to the things of man and the, the, the ways of man and the uncertainty and all the, the conspiracies and all those things. Just look to God. Look at the cross. See, we just, we just look at God, the thing that ne God never changes. See, that'll keep us. That'll, that'll keep us secure and confident in him. See, Jesus instructed the church to remember his death for us on the cross. And we, he, he never told us how often to do it, but he said, but as often as you do do it, do it in remembrance of me. Christ never wanted us to forget the price that he paid for our salvation. And this church, we, we do it once a month. I, I think a lot of churches observe it that way. We do it on the first Sunday of every month, and we're going we're gonna to be taking communion here at the end, at the, end of the message here. And, um, but we are, we are called to remember, we, we are called to remember the price that Christ paid for our salvation. So I believe in January of a new year, it's extremely important for us to remember the cross as we, as we embark on a new year and we, we, we rededicate ourselves and refocus ourselves to who Jesus Christ is. So today in this message, I want us to concentrate on what the cross has secured for us. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, As for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So the first thing I want to look at is the cross is God's grace. The, the cross is God's grace to us. And, you know, what is grace? You know, if you, if you could define the meaning of grace, what, what would it be? Um, is it a prayer? You know, some people, when they, when they have a prayer before their meal or they pray, what, what do they say? They say, Let, let's say grace. You know, and in reality, that's not what grace is. I mean, I'm not saying it's wrong to say that when you pray, but that's not what grace is. Grace, in its most simplest terms, it's something that you and I get that's undeserved. It's something that we, that, we, that we don't deserve. So an example of this, and I've shared this before with this church, could be a financial loan. If you have a loan that you make with your bank or your financial institution, that you, you, you come together in an agreement with a contract, whether it's five years, four years, whatever it is, and you have a, you have a monthly note that you agree that you're going to pay, whether it's your mortgage, your, your car loan, whatever it is, you agree that you are going to pay that amount of money every month. Well, if something happens for whatever reason in one month or you get behind two months or three months, all of a sudden you get behind, well, the bank has a right to come to you and demand that payment because you signed a, an agreement or a contract saying, I'm going to commit to paying this, this payment. They have a right to come to you and ask for that money. And if you are, you're not able to pay that, they can repossess the car or even your home or whatever it is that you weren't able to, weren't able to pay for. But the bank could also choose to say, look, I'm going to give you a delay. I'm going to give you a, 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 an extension on your loan. And I know you're going through some hard times. You can have a three-month, a two-month, a four-month. You can have a, that would be a, considered a grace period. In other words, it wasn't something that they had to do. They wanted no obligation to do it. But they, were, they, were, they extended your payment and they gave you grace. See, that, that's undeserved. But really, when we look at that analogy um, or any, any uh, earthly analogy, the explanation or the, the analogy really dilutes the value of God's grace because of the severity of the implication had it not been extended. In other words, if we don't really understand, we have to understand what grace is, but we also have to understand why we have grace. <laughs> In other words, to really appreciate what it is. So, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. So for God to be just, and he is just, the Bible says that God must punish sin. In other words, sin, sin must be punished. That's what the Bible says, the wages of sin 
is death. So I mentioned to y'all earlier in this year, I'm reading a book by, by uh, Packer, uh, um, J.I. Packer called Knowing God. And um, there's some messages that I have shared with us, but this is a couple of quotes I'm going to share from, from a chapter in that book where he talked about the grace of God. And here he said this, he said, God is not true to himself unless he punishes sin. And unless one knows and feels the truth of this fact, that wrongdoers have no natural hope of anything from God but retributive judgment, one can never share the biblical faith and divine grace. In other words, if we don't understand that our condition as sinners deserves punishment, in other words, from a holy God and from a righteous God, if we don't, if we don't comprehend and understand that, we'll never truly understand the meaning of biblical grace. See, this for me is kind of looking at the meaning of grace in reverse. In other words, instead of looking at grace as what we receive, we look at grace as why, we, why are we getting grace? Why, why was grace so valuable? Why was it so necessary? Because God was under no obligation whatsoever to extend it. We, you can know, no one can ever say, well, you know, I'm a good person. And, you know, I'm not as bad as that, that guy or this person or whatever. I'm, I'm a good person. And God extended his grace because I'm good. It doesn't work that way. The Bible said there's, there's no one good. There's none righteous. There's none who even seek to do good or seek to know God. So we can never stand before God and say, well, God, I know you extended your grace to me because I'm a good person. We're not good. We didn't deserve anything that God, that God, has, that God has given us. We all stand guilty before a holy God, and we all deserve the wrath of God and his punishment. God is not obligated to save us, but a just God must punish sin. So look at this other quote here. It says, only when it is seen that what decides each individual's destiny is whether or not God resolves to save him from his sins, and that is a decision which God need not make in any single case, can one begin to grasp the biblical view of grace. See, God, God was under no obligation whatsoever to extend grace to us. He, in other words, we were dead in our sins, the Bible says, and that was a decision that you and I made. We chose to, to, re, to, to reject God, to go, to go against God and to sin. God was under no obligation to forgive us whatsoever. But by his grace, the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not by works, lest no one should boast. See, that, that's God's remarkable gift to us. And when we, when we look at the cross and we celebrate communion, as we're going to do this morning, we are remembering God's grace. That God, that, 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 that in no untold circumstances, I didn't deserve anything God did for me. But God, God extended his, his, his grace to us. For by grace we are saved, the Bible says. God's wrath. See, Jesus took our punishment that we might be saved. The Bible says he became sin for us that I might become the righteousness of God. He received our punishment. He took, he took the beating. He took the punishment that you and I should have received that we in turn can, be, can, be, can receive the grace of God. Isn't that amazing? That's why you sing that song, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. We didn't deserve what God has done for us. So when we remember the cross, we, we remember God's grace. And then in Colossians chapter 2, it says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, worldliness, manner of life, God made you alive together with Christ, having freely forgiven us all our sins, having canceled, our, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of legal demands which were in force against us and which were hostile to us, and this certificate he has set aside and completely removed by nailing it to the cross. So the next thing is the cross is God's forgiveness. The cross is God's forgiveness. I don't know about you, but there's no greater words that I can receive from someone than for someone to look at me and say, I forgive you. If you've ever done anybody any harm or any wrong or made a mistake or just said something and you didn't know how that person was going to react or what their response was going to be, and you, you approach that person, and instead of maybe getting what you thought they were going to get, they looked right at you and they said, I forgive you. I don't think there could be a, a better words that, that we could hear someone say that. 
And that's what the cross has secured for us, is God's forgiveness. The Bible says that the blood that Jesus shed on the cross completely removed our sins. The Bible says they were removed from, as far as the east is from the west. That, that, that's what the, what, what the blood of Jesus has done for us. So one of the greatest illustrations of forgiveness in the Bible, I believe, is the parable of the unmerciful servant. And um, yeah, many of y'all are familiar with this. I'm not going to read the whole parable. I'm just going to read the beginning of it here in Matthew 18. It says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. And let him go. See, Jesus here in this parable is giving us an analogy or a picture of the cross. And in, 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 this, in this parable that Christ is sharing here, this servant is, this servant is, a, is, is, is here before, before, this, before this king, and he owes, it says, 10,000 bags of gold. And some other uh, translations say talents, and all, some of them translate it into actual dollars. And a lot of people get hung up with the value or the, 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 um, the value of, of the 10,000 or whatever it is. But that's not the point that Christ was making here. The point that Jesus was making is that no matter how great the debt was, it could never be paid. In other words, if he was given such a large number was, is to get our minds to understand the, the debt was so big, there's no way you could pay it. In other words, it was impossible. So what was the comparison that Christ was making? It was our sin. It was the debt of our sin. It was the, it was the heaviness of the, of the weight of the sin that every one of us carried with us when we were born into this world that none of us could ever pay back. And, and, and so this servant come, comes before this king and, and says, says, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. And the, the, king, the king says, I have mercy on me. And what did he do? He just forgave him. He forgave the debt, a debt that the servant could have never paid. He just wiped the slate clean and said, I forgive you. Imagine what that would have felt like. He was, his children, his family, his wife, all his possessions were going to be taken from him. And in this one clean sweep, the, the, the king said, I, I forgive you. That's what the cross has done for us. We stood before God with a heavy weight of sin, with a debt that was so heavy. We, we were weighed down with this. There's nothing we could do. Good works would never, would never get it. We could never pay for it, even no, no matter how hard we tried. God would never receive that. But God looked at us and he allowed his son Christ to be, to be crucified on a cross. And then he said, if you receive Christ, if Christ is in you, then I forgive you. That, that, that has been wiped out. We've been forgiven. That, that's something to rejoice about. See, that's up. 2020 didn't take that from me. 2021 is not going to remove that. I'm still forgiven. I'm forgiven. My past, present, and future sins in Christ Jesus are forgiven. That's something to get excited about and to rejoice about. And the, the, the rest of the parable, and really Christ shared this parable to teach us a lesson about, about forgiving others. And what, what Christ was saying is, because if you read the beginning of the parable, Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? And Peter said, um, seven times. And the Lord said, no, up to 70 times. Or seven times seven. In other words, there was, no, there was no limit to how many times we should forgive. And then Christ shared this parable. And I didn't just because of time, and that really wasn't the focus of my message. I didn't share the balance of it, but, but if you read the rest of the parable, the, the servant, after he had been given so much, he went and, and approached someone that, that, that owed him money, but it was like $100. It was like nothing. And, and the Bible says that he had him thrown in jail and had him put, put away and said, I demand that you pay this back. And the Lord was angry with him because the Lord said, how can you, who have received so much forgiveness, not forgive so little. And, and we know that's the, that's the lesson of, of, um, of, of forgiveness, that we have been forgiven so much that we are really obligated to forgive others. We cannot receive the forgiveness of the cross and say, well, I'm not going to forgive someone else. It doesn't work that way. You've been forgiven more than you could ever pay back, and no one could ever do to you the, any, anywhere close to the, to, the, to, the, to the forgiveness that we've received and for our sins from Christ. So 
So forgiveness is a big deal. Grace is a big deal. See, God is calling his church, keep your eyes on the cross. Keep your eyes on the, on the grace of God. Keep your eyes like, God's forgiven me. I'm forgiven. I'm, I'm cleansed. I'm, I'm, I'm pure. I'm walking as a child of God. I'm not worried about 2020 and the world circumstances and all the governments and world events. I've got the cross. I've got Jesus Christ. God has forgiven me. That's something for us to celebrate and to be excited about. And then in Romans chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, it says, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The cross is God's love. The cross is God's love. See, no matter what 2021 brings me or how much this world changes, there's one thing that remains constant. God loves me. That'll never change. That, that, that's a constant thing. I don't care what happens, what, what this world brings, what the election does, whatever. That one thing will remain constant. God loves me. God, God loves you. And the Bible said God loved us so much that he sent his only son to die for us. See, the world can't take these things away from us. The world can't take away the love of God. The Bible says greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. And that's what Christ has done for us. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave us his son. For God so loved that he gave us his son, that he gave us Jesus Christ. And see, God's love is not like man's love. He, his love in the, is the purest meaning of what love is. For the Bible says God himself is love. It's, it's an unconditional agape love, the Bible says, that God loves us the way we are. And while we were still sinners, the Bible says Christ died for us. So it was in our sinful state, in our rebellious condition, Jesus Christ died for us. 1 John chapter 4 says, There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. But perfect, complete, full-grown love drives out fear. Because fear involves the expectation of divine punishment. So the one who is afraid of God's judgment is not perfected in love, has not grown into a sufficient understanding of God's love. The Bible says there was no fear in love. Why? Because God's love is perfect love. That God's love is unconditional love. That God loves you just the way you are. You don't have to become or perform or do anything or, or, or do anything. God loves you for who you are. And that, that to me gives me great hope. That gives me great, great hope. See, so when... So what do we do in 2021 as we approach this year? We don't know what the year, what, what the year holds. When we, January of last year, we had no clue what, what 2020 was going to bring. We just thought it was going to be a regular year. And now everybody's saying, well, here comes 2021. I'm so thankful. We don't know what 2021 is going to bring. It, we don't know. But I do know this. The cross stands before me. The cross remains the same. Governments, no matter who's occupying the White House, the world can't take it away from us. The world can't take that away from us. So, so I just want to tell this church, keep your eyes on the cross. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus Christ, for Christ never changes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I'm just going to ask Ruby just to begin to play that, those, that music and those songs that we had there, if you don't mind. And I'm just going to ask everyone just to stand to your feet here for a moment. We should, you know, we should be excited to celebrate communion. Or aren't you? In other words, see, the world wants to take away the things that excite the Christian. They want to dilute the things that we get excited about and make us more concerned about the ways of the world. This, this is the meaning of Christianity. Without the cross, they, we wouldn't be a Christian. Without the cross, there wouldn't be a church. That God was willing to die for us to give us eternal life. So we celebrate, we celebrate the meaning of Christianity. We celebrate Jesus Christ today as we take communion. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Father. So I'm just going to ask you just to come up here and just to take, let the ushers here serve you all and just come and, and, and grab, uh, grab the cup and grab.